Well, first of all, my my beard is white, so you're going to get no <laughs> empathy from me. But uh, yeah, I mean, they got their money. You know, I get you know millions of dollars, 243 pages, and we get the term generally aware. You know, I it's it is what it is. You know, from day one, I, I thought this was overblown from. Uh, a league standpoint, I talked to a number of players, a number of quarterbacks. They didn't think it was that big of a deal. Uh, you know, but the Patriots have the reputation they have, and, and certain people are jealous of their success. So it, it's going to be played, you know, one way from one group of people, and the Patriots supporters go the opposite direction, and really nothing gets accomplished. But, uh, you know, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I just don't. I agree that the action is not that big of a deal, but how about Brady, you know, suggesting he doesn't know who the guys are, basically kind of, you know, I don't want to say covering it up, but he obviously, these guys knew who Brady was and certainly to some extent had some sort of orders to do this. Wouldn't you agree? Well, yeah, I, I'm not denying that. I, and, you know, that was kind of my take. And maybe I'm cynical, but <laughs> did anybody believe Tom Brady at first when he said he knew nothing about it? Right. Anyone who's been around the NFL for any amount of time knows the quarterbacks know everything about the footballs used in the games. And specifically, it, it's it's Peyton Manning and Tom Brady who've kind of morphed this system to where you can break in the ball. So I think everyone knew that at least – you know, maybe not the casual public, but uh, so to me, it wasn't, you know, did people expect him to go in that press conference and say, yeah, I did it. I mean, I, I expected the denial uh, and I expected what came out and the fact that uh, nothing was going to ha- happen to those footballs without without Tom Brady's approval. So. In your opinion, I know we both, I think, agree that I don't think it's a big deal, but does the NFL need to set an example? Do you anticipate Brady getting nailed here, or are they just going to kind of say, eh, we got to do something, two games just to show that we're doing something, but we don't want to really hurt your season? Yeah, my initial thought was one game, uh, and even that I, I kind of wavered because you think about the Patriots as Super Bowl champion, so obviously they'll be on the Thursday night opener, and, and, and that's a concern for the league. Uh, but now that I, I've stepped back, and, you know, the problem is, and it dates back to the Ray Rice issue, it really, and, and we've talked about it time and time again, is the lack of credibility from Roger Goodell. So all these instances – you know, from a public relations standpoint, you ask yourself, does he have to be more heavy-handed because he's under the microscope? And obviously, if you look at his relationship with Robert Kraft on top of that, uh, it's going to look bad from a league's perspective if the Patriots only get a slap on the wrist. So if it's a harsher suspension, then I think it will simply be fueled uh, by the PR aspect, I, I don't think people in the league uh, uh, really think it's worthy of some, you know, some people have thrown out this wild speculation that they should be, you know, Brady should be suspended for the year or the Patriots, you know, uh, a first-round pick should be taken from them. That kind of talk is ridiculous. Uh, but it might be more heavy-handed simply because they have to be. If this isn't Tom Brady... I mean, we don't care a lot to begin with, but if it's not Tom Brady, does it even get mentioned? No, it doesn't. Uh, Because, you know, if it's not the Patriots more than Tom Brady, I mean, yeah, Tom Brady's sort of the poster boy of the league, sort of almost the, you know, the Derek Jeter front man of the league. So that that plays it up a little bit uh, because he is who he is and he's got the supermodel wife and he's handsome and all that nonsense. Uh, but it's more the fact that the Patriots and their reputation and obviously dating back to Spygate and just so many people uh, dislike Bill Belichick and so many people, to be blunt, are, are, are jealous of the Patriots' success. So if this were the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or you name it, Tennessee Titans, whoever, it wouldn't have been an issue. So the NFL, John, spends $5 million bucks, 243 pages, over 100 days – on all this, 
I find that to be pretty bizarre that they decided to uh, put that much money and all of this effort into finding this out. Do you feel that the Wells report was thorough enough to be taken as credible? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was credible. I, I certainly think it was thorough. I mean, I think it's absurd to put that many assets into this uh, and to have, you know, if you looked at the report and the 243 pages and the appendix and the graphs and, and it, you know, you almost had to have Bill Nye, the science guy, talk about, <laughs> you know, the inflation of footballs. Uh, they certainly went overboard, and it, and it speaks to the fact that the league has such – a shaky reputation in these types of matters, uh, they feel forced into doing this overkill. And it all harkens back to Park Avenue. It all goes directly back to the office of Roger Goodell because people do not trust him. And I don't understand the 32 owners of this league can't put two and two together and understand they're not going to be able to move forward credibly at least in these types of issues until someone at the top has credibility to do it. John McMullen's the NFL editor, sportsnetwork.com. You've got a full story on this. And basically the premise of your story is to grow up. And who are you, for the listeners out there, kind of telling to grow up here? Who is the story kind of directed towards? Because I think it's a very well, well written. I, 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 It's both sides, basically, because, you know, uh if you think about it, the only thing that's happened here is you have the two camps, and you have the one camp that just, you know, hates the Patriots, and they, you know, they talk about their cheaters, they don't deserve this, they don't deserve this legacy, Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, and you have the other camp, which is, you know, Patriots uh, fans and, and, and people who just say, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, everybody does it. Uh, it. It's not that big of a deal. You're picking on us. And you really get nothing accomplished. So, you know, but my whole point with, with the column was that, you know, we're always so surprised. And I don't understand that. And I, you know, I, I talk about Alex Rodriguez. You remember when when everyone was saying he was going to rescue baseball from Barry Bonds. And, and we talk about Lance Armstrong and, and how great he was and Tiger Woods and all this hero worship. The bottom line is professional sports, and as I said, NASCAR rules apply. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. And for those who un don't understand that, you know, that's where I said grow up. Uh, John, great stuff on that. Let's flip over to your other piece uh, over at sportsnetwork.com. Where uh, do you have the same message for LaShawn McCoy grow up? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you know, LaShawn McCoy comes across to me as sort of a spurned ex and, and you know, taking shots at Chip Kelly. And they're, they're very irresponsible, especially in this environment uh, that we're in. I mean, you know, we're, we're days off a major American city being on fire because of racial, racial issues. And, and, and to throw out those charges... Uh, which in, in essence LaShawn McCoy did, and Stephen A. Smith to a certain degree uh, toward Chip Kelly is just, you know, completely unfair. If you look at what he's done, of course he's moved on from Deshaun Jackson. Of course he's moved on uh, from Shady and, and Jeremy Macklin. But, you know, look at the replacements. It doesn't take, uh, you know, uh, an advanced degree to know that, uh, every receiver he's brought in has is, is been African American. The two running backs to replace, uh, you know, think about moving on from Nick Foles, and you have a uh, a quarterback who's part Native American, another quarterback who's Latino American. It's it's just, you know, I said if Chip Kelly's a racist, he's not a very good one. Uh, it, it just doesn't hold up, and it and and it all goes back to Riley Cooper. It goes back to one incident because Chip Kelly didn't cut Riley Cooper. And to be honest, I'm surprised he didn't do it because it would have been easier for him. Uh, but Chip only thinks in football. Sense. Well, let me, let me stop you real quick and ask you a question. Okay, so this situation comes up. This gets thrown at Kelly the first time, is his first year in the league. Was it the fact that he didn't cut him, or was it the fact that he then rewarded him with the contract that you think maybe has these African-American players that are outspoken about it, or coaches, because Trey Thomas – as well, and media, Stephen A. Smith, that has them somewhat outraged? 
I think it's both because they look at Riley Cooper and they don't see what Chip Kelly sees. They they just rate receivers on on what we normally rate receivers on, and that's the fact of production catching the football. And that's not what Chip Kelly sees in Riley Cooper. He he sees a six foot three, six foot four guy who blocks, and that's what you need in a read option. You need guys on the edge playing the wide receiver position that can block. And that's not sexy, and that doesn't make sense uh, to people who maybe don't follow the game as closely as others do. Uh, and, and, again, they just look at it and say, well, Jeremy Macklin's a much better receiver than Riley Cooper. Deshaun Jackson's a much better receiver than Riley Cooper. And they are as far as production goes. But Riley Cooper isn't replacing those players. The receivers replacing them are Jordan Matthews are, uh, you know, Nelson Aguilar, you know, hopefully Josh Huff. Those are the guys who are supposed to catch the football and do the damage. Riley Cooper's there for a specific reason, and we all know what that is, to be a blocker and as a complimentary guy. Yeah, that's pretty evident, and and you mentioned some of the other things uh, around the team. I said, you know, LaShawn McCoy comes out and says, you know, he gets rid of all the good black players, um, you know, the, the good ones. Well, he did trade Nick Foles. I mean, to me, it's pretty evident that he was just looking to upgrade regardless of cover, uh, color. He chose Michael Vick over uh, Nick Foles when he had the opportunity to make that decision. So I, I, I find this to be a little bit odd. But I wonder if it just, again, goes back to that. If that Cooper thing didn't exist, would all this stuff be out there? No, it wouldn't, because that's the only thing you can really hang your hat on if you're going to make this charge. Uh, and it's understandable because of, you know, obviously he embarrassed himself and the organization. There's no question about that. Uh, but that's really the only thing you can ha- hang your hat on right. uh, if you want to make this charge. And, and it, as long as he remains there, uh, people will lean on that, even though the, the evidence points in a different direction. Uh, but that's something, you know, if Chip, you know, decides one day he wants to pay attention to the spin in the public relations, he might move on from Riley Cooper. That hasn't been his M.O. He's a football guy 24-7. He's not, you know, thinking about race relations. He doesn't think about, you know, how it I- impacts uh, people's views on him. He's just thinking about football. Uh, and, you know, from Shady's standpoint, it, it, again, it's not about African Americans. It's not about stars. It's about, you know, I and me players versus team players. And I think, you know, unfairly, even in the players he's cut, uh, I think, you know, Deshaun Jackson, Shady McCoy, clearly he wanted to move on from those players. And he looks at them as, as I type players. Jeremy Macklin, completely different. Uh, the Eagles wanted him back. They were just outspent by the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, so you're really only talking about two players. And, you know, Chip Kelly's not the only one that would look at those two specific players and say, you know, they're not the, the most, you know, uh, team guys in the locker room. And, and And they themselves probably wouldn't even deny that. John, I want to ask your opinion on uh, Lael Collins. We talked about him when you were on earlier in the week, and I said, you know, here's a guy who kind of lucked out. He gets a pick and choose where he wants to go. Now, he didn't get a huge deal, three years, $1.6 million. He can renegotiate that after the second year. But how about Dallas? Is this a big coup for them to be able to land Collins? Where would he have been drafted, and how big of a signing is this for Dallas? Uh, it's a, it's a huge signing uh, from a talent standpoint. I mean, you're talking about a top 15 or 20 player in the draft. Uh, I, I, you know, his floor would have been 21 to Cincinnati. So you're, you're talking about a very talented guy and, and going to an offensive line that was already probably the best in football. Uh, you know, and but the Cowboys, you know, the one advantage they have, and and you know, is that Jerry Jones can afford to take chances that other NFL general managers can't, and it's for rather obvious reasons. He he's never going to fire himself. So when you talk about whoever, whether it's Collins, whether it's Randy Gregory, whether it's Greg Hardy, uh, whether it's Des Bryant, uh, you know, roll down the list of names, you know. It's a concern for other general managers because if things like that blow up in their faces, they might pay with their jobs. Obviously, Jerry Jones is never going to fire himself. 
So the Cowboys can afford to take these types of chances. And, and you know, they got a very talented kid. And I, I think people have quickly moved on uh, from the obviously the murder case and, and the police, uh, you know, have been very for, in forefront and said Collins has not been a suspect, but he hasn't been totally cleared of any wrongdoing. Let's remember that. You know, we all hope he had nothing to do uh, with that crime, uh, you know, but we've all seen enough Dateline NBC to know just sure. because you're not in a place doesn't mean he couldn't have hired somebody. So there's still some concerns. And and the Cowboys are the one team with the general manager that doesn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. They can take those chances. John, on the uh, last note here on the Eagles, a uh, report today that uh, Chip Kelly was calling all around the NFL to try to get Michael Kendrick, a second-round pick for Michael Kendricks. Now, we have heard Chip Kelly say many times that no players have been discussed. He believed that, or he had said that Kendricks will be here, but if he was calling around and wasn't able to get a second-round pick, does that tell you – that Kendricks will be here or that they're going to keep trying? Oh, they're going to keep trying. I, I mean, there's no question about it. I, I mean, we we know Kiko Alonso is there. He's he's slated to start. D'Amico Ryan's is slated to start. And also you bring in Jordan Hicks. I mean, how many inside linebackers do you need? Uh, and, you know, there's speculation. You could kick somebody out to the outside, but understand – who do you have out there? Connor Barwin, Brandon Graham, both highly paid. Both are going to be on the field. Uh, he doesn't fit here. It's pretty clear. Chip Kelly, for whatever reason, uh, has decided you know he would like to move on from that particular player. But you know he, like a lot of fans out there, you know put you know unfortunately uh, that's the way this league is. And, and a guy like Kendricks, even though he's a proven player, even though I, I think he's an ascending player. Uh, and I see a lot more in him than Chip Kelly does. Uh, you know, he's not going to get you a second-round pick in this environment. NFL teams value draft picks above all else. If he can get a, a, a fourth-round conditional pick or something like that, uh, I think that's the eventual end game. and I don't think Michael Kendricks is going to be here. All right, uh, we'll keep our eye on that. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, one of the interesting stories. We'll see what happens with him. Mathis and Boykin, those three names continuing to remain in Philadelphia, but for how long? Well, the off season is uh, still a ways to go as we get to training camp in August. John McMullen over at SportsNetwork.com for more on all of the big NFL stories, including your favorite Deflate Gate news of the day. Thank you, John. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike.